hepatitis, I mean, the first reason for liver transplant, which is crazy. Now it is uh, biliary atresia and other different diseases. And uh, the mortality is zero. And the survival was 100%. And the survival of uh, the graft, as you can see here, 96.2 with very low complication rate. So every, every of our divisions has a mortality and morbidity meeting every month where we get this, this kind of data, but to just put liver transplant as an, as an example with their results. Another message is, well, let's compare with, with the secretary, we did this. Let's compare 2019 cutting in June and October and see how are we working now with, with each of the divisions to, to, to see how, how they manage. And so we did this central or, yes, and these are all the specialties, cardiovascular, general, plastic, endoscopy, the ones I show. And the totals, we did a 41% less, talking about electric surgery, if we look at June 2019, when we look at all of them, but if we see each of them, for example, cardiovascular only 52% and general surgery 48%, but when we go to different ones, we have different numbers. Of course, if you see a, a, a sp spinal surgery, I mean, it's um, orthopedic spinal surgery, I'm sorry, they have less, less and less percentage. And we went to October, it was nearly the same. We, we have a little more, we have 210 procedures more in 2019 also, and one for five in 2020 in pandemia. So we did this for each of the facilities and started working with them. And we focus on the neonates. For us, the neonates are one of our pearls as surgeons. And in our United, United in our NICU, we have an OR. So we built an OR not to move our newborns. So this is the way that operative room worked. We did 101 procedures. Uh, previous to pandemia, we have developed a fetal program, which was like, we take care of, of a prenatal diagnosis of many mothers. And so we have a consultant and we do cesarean section, elective cesarean section in this or in the NICU to prevent the neonates coming from other places, especially a CDH program, which is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia program. That program, I'm very proud of developing it and getting that or in the NICU and getting those mothers coming because we, we are having less mortality rate and it's a, it's a very good program. But nowadays, we need it to cancel. So that's, that's sad. I think we will get it back. Uh, we still get the neonates, but the, the mothers are, are taking care in our in our other partners, hospitals, and those kids, when they, get trans, when they get in their translation and they are coming to the hospital, have a lot of problems. And so, but those are the, the surgeries that we did in neonates, general surgery where 60 and cardiovascular, urology, neurosurgery, endoscopy, those are the procedures done in our OR. Then, Another message, the relations with the bed. I'm sorry for the Spanish. Our directors were very, very obsessive. Don't, don't, I mean, you cannot do surgery because we need the beds. I mean, there are 600 beds. <laughs> so, and, and you know that COVID is not a big population, is, is, is children's, but we need it. That was a fight there. So we developed, this is in Spanish also, something because I have in charge a group of pediatricians that are taking care of the, this is a very nice uh, project also, taking care of the pre-surgical process. 
So the surgical process where we have a pre-admission, we try not to get the patients in the OR, they come the same day, they go most of them the same day as they can, but they had to have this uh, PCR done and the family had to have the PCR done and they had to stay when they come from outside. Uh, that process is called pre-admission and our very surgical process is in charge of a clinician, of a pediatrician, but that coordinator is under my, uh, you know, I am the coordinator of all the chief of the divisions and I also have him. So we worked a lot as a team and this is what we de de designed for the directors just not to bother us, don't do surgery because we won't have beds. So I show you because I think it was useful in Spanish. This is only a period, just one of the periods that we did the numbers, which is from May to September. And we saw like 2,001, 32 patients. And we told them which were, were not in the hospital coming electively for surgery. Half of them, oh, not half, but more than half were coming from the intensive care or from the, this is SIM with this intermediate care that we have all our room, all our beds are intermediate care. We don't have like, uh, when, when they have a very simple operation, okay, they go home, but we don't have that kind of inpatient. So we have intensive or medium, intermediate. Most of our patients that came into the OR an emergency, you see? So we are not getting them. Of course, they were all surgical patients, but they were getting in, into the hospital because if there's a word always into the clinicians and the surgeons, yes? And all the power in this hospital, all the directors are clinicians. So I am the one that had to translate the surgical problems to the clinicians. Most of them are my age and I know them from very young. So it's, hard, it's nice to discuss, but sometimes it gets tough. So with this, they were relaxed. You see, we are doing surgery, but most of these kids are coming from you. So please don't bother us. We will continue doing elective surgery because it, that was a do only emergency. Everyone was in panic. And what could have been that? What could have happened to all these children that I show you? that we did safely, all the transplants. If we were not here with a group, just trying to, to convince and working hard. So these a 600 enter through the operative rooms, what we call surgical center. In the surgical center, we get the patients the, the, the same day that, that they are going to have to Surgery. That's what you do in the States, I mean, but it's not very often that happens in Latinoamerica. This is something that we did with this coordinator, which I appreciate a lot, because he's very involved in the surgical programs. And that's the nice thing to do, to get people involved from different areas with the real time. Because most of the clinicians sometimes are not so involved with what an OR is. So we were happy to tell them that 46% of these patients that came through the op were kept in our area and sent home. Even some complex cases, even a laparoscopy that was doing early, but could be sent home. All right. So, and then we needed, of course, 135 NICU, uh, sorry, NICU, not neonatal, but uh, intensive care uh, beds, and 216 intermediate beds. But with this kind of uh, data got, we could discuss every day, and they let us do our elective cases safely. Otherwise, they can say, stop doing elective cases. And now, of course, I will tell you, I won't put you here at the protocols because Nia has them. They are very, 
homemade done, but they were useful to communicate with young, with nurses, with residents, with new people. We got the new residents in the middle of pandemia. And we, have, we had to extend the residency program to October. In June, we had to cut the residency program. We needed to cut it in October. So the chief residents and the previous residents stayed to October. But in October, we got the new ones. And new ones means not only surgeons, but new clinicians, new nurses, new everything. And it, you know, it's hard to teach and to, to be effective with people in training. So that was also another. So it was nice to have the protocols and, and we, de we decided this is the ore. This is Planta Baja is where the ore is. With this. And the, the red one were the, the ores that we decided were going to use only for COVID, PCR positive patients or PCR that are not ready yet were considered COVID positive or were treated differently. And they come, they, they went to a different in room and they came because it's the first, first floor and this is the uh, basement, yes, where the ore is. Where the elevators were, we made these plans, we made videos showing them how the, the way to the ore was different and we worked a lot with this, with these protocols and their videos that I want to show you. Because. And so this is the active, active COVID surgical rooms. In June, July, in August, July, August, September, October, December, how many activated protocols were done? Because as I told you, now we have double, we are activating protocols every day because we duplicated the patients that we are doing and we have more cases. But as I told you, if, a, if they are tested, we don't need to activate just such an, a, an, a protocol. Of course, we take care, but not in the same way. And then is where my passion is, and I think we will finish with this and exchange with you any questions and any you know, suggestions that will be very nice for us to receive. Telesimulation, you know, ours is a place where we develop a lot of simulation, presidential simulation, in low cost models, we develop our models. We, we have some fancy things, but most of our, our strengths is the devotion and the dedication of a group of educators that develop programs and develop models and in which many scrub nurses are involved. Uh, but we couldn't do it in pandemia. It was completely here. Center now connected, but I was you know, I have a prohibition to come in. So the concept of tele simulation arrived, and I have a short video to show. But first of all, I, I, I have this, which is the name of our CESIM. What does it mean? Garham is the hospital. Se is center. Sim, simulation. We have a CESIM surgical simulation place in Garham, and you can. You can get to our videos, some of them are published in our YouTube channel. This is the YouTube that is CESIM Quirúrgico in Spanish, but the videos are in English, some of them. We have an Instagram, which is CESIM, barra low here, Quirúrgico. Quirúrgico is surgical, and so you can get it. We have a Facebook and we have a mail. So if you want to contact us, here it says join us. We, we wait for you. And it's Centro Simulacion Caraham. Hmm? Ahora, I, this is a very short video that shows very, very, very fast many of our ways. I and mean, we have developed kind of models. This is a group share because it's like many holes, like the cheese 
and we develop inside the you see this is very low cost and, and it, a wall we train our residents we have trained like 750 stations of uh, surgeons and residents in pediatric surgery from many parts of Latin America and other parts of the world in groups of 10. So our work is very hard uh, developing these models and this, as you see, telecommunication. But it stopped completely in March. And we have courses uh, posted for the whole year, and people writing and saying, and we have the new residents that are coming inside doing appendectomies. So we started this telesimulation, which is very short video also. Anyone that is interested, I'm very glad to connect and give you whatever you need with this concept of make it simple. We cannot waste a lot of money and time. So using any, any of these trainers that we have with a webcam connected to a computer or Developing like a tablet trainer, this we made it ourselves, is good. And getting an external vision of the ergonomy with a telephone, we made this kit for a very basic, what we call essentials, that we developed this kit initially for IPEC to develop the essential course, which is very easy to send or to develop. And how did we connect? It's a Zoom platform, this is in my office, and our session of the views, external views. I have educators staying at home, and the residents may have this at home. And one of the educators was having one just to show if there's something more to show. We make the break rooms and we get like two students each, or, and we also make our debriefings. Uh, and up till now, we got very, very useful data of this process. And that's why we are sharing it with the SAGES Go Global Committee and, of course, developing different things using these principles. Here we are listening to one of our residents doing. Of course, you can use advanced technology if you want. That was our. This is OCDE, it's the Communication Distance Office. We used to do this with more sophisticated models, and they are published like new natural models. But nowadays, we need to continue teaching. And this is not cost effective. This is not cost money. It is very cost effective. And I am sure that we will continue doing it even after the pandemic. So the basic, the essential courses that we used to do will be done like this from now on. Of course, it seems simple, but it needs dedication, logistic, and of course you need a link, a, a brain link. I mean, I think that maybe you are in a country that you get technology and you get many things easily. And I love it. I would love to have. I would love to have been born in the United States. <laughs> I, I, I love to go there. I love to. I love to learn. I like to receive. I, I really enjoy many many things that you have. But sometimes there is a nice what I call blend. Exact for our Latin American colleagues. I always give a lecture that is. Find the perfect blend. Get, get that. Don't, be, don't have prejudice. Don't be, you know, criticizing what you don't have. Get it. Know it. Get to know. Get to the information. And then when you come and you have your feet on your ground, in the place where you belong, you develop the perfect blend. Get the blend, like the coffee. Uh, and so I think this is important for the generations because that's the way our children, because we have pediatric surgeons, but our patients, I take care of patients of 18, 19, and 20 with many malformations, especially pelvic and, and female reconstructive surgery malformations. 
and they are not only children, but they, they get the best that they can when people get involved, get, when people get linked, when brace, brains get linked to get those products. That, that's something I truly believe. And this is the last message I have. Here it says Ateneo Central, yes? This is uh, like your meetings, uh, every week meetings, that the hospital have meetings with every, of course we are doing them in Zoom. We are not doing presential meetings in the rooms, but we are having them. And this is acute abdomen, something that we made with the general surgery group and with the pre-surgical group, the clinicians, because there was, uh, People wonder if with the COVID times, we, are, we were doing later surgeries to the acute abdomen. And so the clinicians were saying, the surgeons are doing the surgery some hours after because they are waiting for the PCR and people and children are getting into trouble. So we made a data collection of all those acute abdomens treated during COVID times. And this group uh, works through data, which is just two or three that I will show you, but especially the conclusion. What was the time to taken to go into surgery versus complication? And here, no and yes, and the percentage of complications. So you see during from, the 20, from April to June, hmm, the, how there were no complications after because of the time, the conclusions. And if we can get to the PCR, it was very useful for the institution. But what was seen is that we had more complex cases. Why? People were not. So the patients were not coming earlier. So from the two conclusions, we found that acute, advanced acute abdomen were more common in relation to pre consult and the adaptation to the protocol didn't have a negative impact in the evolution of complications. So this, this paper is going to be published, but it was very useful for the team to be relaxed that if we had an acute abdomen done 24 hours later with medication, waiting for the, for the PCR was not a bad thing for the institution. But we needed to work in people staying at home without bringing the children with acute abdomen because of fear. This is, now it's over. I mean, we are in October and we are getting more like surviving with the virus and living with the virus. Although, as I showed you in the have more cases. And uh, as I told you, I think we, you asked me about the machine. I mean, our country, the only machine that the government has make an arrangement is the Russian. I'm, I'm laughing because I know that in the scientific community, this is not the best one. For many different, different reasons that I don't know very precisely, and I prefer not to give my opinion if I am not an expert in that, we, can, we are not going to get the Pfizer machine. And uh, the Oxford one, AstraZeneca, is starting to say that maybe, but the only one that we got, and in my hospital, it only 400 doses, and they promised that we have, we will may get more, is the Russian. So, uh, <laughs> I cannot say many things about uh, the vaccination, the, or the machine, or, or, or this plan in my country. Maybe in two months, I, I may have some more information. So thank you for your time and thank you for, for the honor of making me share and helping us with these very difficult times. Thank you a lot.
Thanks so much, Dr. Bailas. Um, I know uh, uh, we want to open up for questions. This is an excellent presentation and we are so grateful um, for your passion and your willingness to share um, uh, uh, this morning. Um, I wanted to um, uh, uh, let Dr. Langham, he's a professor in pediatric surgery here um, at UTHSC in Le Bonheur, uh, Children's Hospital. Um, he ha wanted to make a comment here and I wanted to make sure he had an opportunity to do so. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nia, and thank you very much, Dr. Bailez. It was a phenomenal presentation. Um, I, in times of crisis, um, emphasize the importance of good leadership. And I think the uh, hospital and the children in Buenos Aires have benefited from your leadership. The flexibility, creativity, and uh, attention to data um, in learning through this difficult period is obvious in your talk. So congratulations and please, as citizens of the world, accept our thanks for the work you do. Um, I think it is obvious to most of the uh, students and uh, staff here, the level of sophistication of this hospital. Um, they have a transplant program that is dramatically more capable and better than us. Uh, with better results and uh, has a um, impressive, the most impressive thing I found as somebody who's been involved in transplantation uh, earlier in my career is the low number of retransplantation, which means that the post-operative uh, and long-term care that these children are getting is superb uh, because uh, many centers have much higher rates of retransplantation. Also, the congenital diaphragmatic hernia program with in-hospital delivery is something that makes me jealous. We've tried for 15 years here to do this and have not been successful. And it uh, allows much more controlled environment and uh, a better mortality rate for that difficult condition. So um, for those of you who don't do pediatric surgery every day, the level of sophistication of the institution Dr. Bailez has presented us as uh, world-class um, and better than ours. My question, Dr. Bailez, was that uh, about the testing. You, you have done a huge number of PCR tests. And uh, at St. Jude's Hospital, we have a random testing um, of staff uh, that we, when we come to work, we get uh, tested uh, periodically. At Le Bonner, at our general pediatric hospital, uh, staff are not tested because of uh, the limitations of uh, testing numbers. And we, we are just guessing, we're screening based on um, this. So I'm curious as to whether you were testing staff and how helpful you found that data in managing COVID. Yeah, thank you for the question. As I told you, uh, maybe the uh, starting testing the the surgical patients was something coming from the from the surgical group and it was very much resisted by the rest because it's finally now patients and mothers are, for the sake of the institution and for uh, to continue doing what we have been doing without stopping is done we are not doing this in the in the staff no so which might have been but uh, the staff is being tested by uh, uh, antibodies i mean eg EGK and EGK, yes so we are this is something that's not under my umbrella but the the um, committee crisis, which is in charge of the infection, infectious specialist, infectious disease specialist, uh, is not, and the government, and the, you know, the Ministry of Health is not doing this in the staff. What, what, has, what is being done is a very close, it's a very close follow of uh, any contact. And getting the patients and the mother into the hospital, test it. I mean, the one that is coming in is something that was considered to be, uh, as I can tell you, we, we are not experts. And I, I won't tell you that this is the way to go. 
but the protocols of taking care with, especially with using the EPP, that we were very, very strong in that. I mean, the hospital bought everything. I mean, the masks, the N95, and uh, uh, everything to take care of patients uh, with protection for the staff. We, we didn't buy ourselves the protection, which sometimes in other conversations I heard it happened. Uh, this, as I told you, this is a public hospital, this is a populist government now, but I think that they have not behaved so well with the testing of the whole population. Uh, we have very little testing in numbers of the population, and we have a high testing in patients inside our hospital. You see, this is not something that is not standards for everyone. That's what I, I wanted to say. And I, I agree that we might have been uh, followed as a staff better. But uh, as I show you, every week, one of the directors is showing us how many of our staff got infected. And we have seen that more people got infected I mean, colleagues in the numbers, I don't have that here, but we discussed this last week. More colleagues have been infected between the group that stayed not coming to the hospital. I don't know if that happens everywhere, but for example, the chief of ophthalmology, who is uh, 63, has been coming with tele telework three times a week, developed the program of retinoblastoma, was very, was very, you know, worried about getting infected because of ophthalmology, they are always over the patients, just getting examination sometimes in patients that are, 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 are we awake and not asleep. And well, she went on holiday, she went to the falls because she, and she got infected there. Uh, we have uh, one of our clinicians that's not coming because she's obese, she's diabetic. And in October, she decided that she wanted to see her sister. She got infected. So it's, uh, it, we are seeing that in socialization, in some family meetings or not outside or are more proclivity to get infected. We don't have any. Uh, infected, detected with patients in the hospital in this whole uh, time. With, with this, I mean, these protocols and, and the community crisis is working very hard on that. I'm not the expert, so I just join them sometimes because it's my responsibility. But they are proud of this. Of course, they can lie if you think, yes. but it's very hard to know where you get infected. Uh, we no, had a I, I, I... I'm sorry, I, I um, uh, agree with you. I think this is exactly what we have found here. And I think that the uh, very careful use of PPE that you describe is what we've tried to do, have not tested our staff, but the staff members who have gotten sick here generally have gotten sick through socialization, not from patients. So our experience yes, is what you're yes. describing. Oh, okay. That's why we are going through, because I, there was a group in the OR, I had two nurses. And they, what, but you know, I understand the feelings. Uh, we are all getting, you know, very, very tired. And then, and it's, it's terrible. Yes. <laughs> I, work, I work in different places. I love neonatal surgery. And so I work in a, in a NICU, outside the hospital, it's a private one. It's a very fancy one and we do very ni nice in MIS surgery, but they don't test them, they don't test. So I had to be like a, a robot when I go and do surgery because I say, they don't test. They say it's not necessary, you are using the protocol, but the protocols are not so strict as in, as in the hospital. Because when we go in protocol here, nobody goes in or out the or it's different. You can have an N95 and a, like a facial something, but that's not the whole protocol. If you don't get the, the, the gowns correctly, nobody's taking your... And after 
five, three, four hours when we used to put down the, the air condition. I mean, we couldn't use the air condition at the beginning. Now we are using the air condition. I mean, we will die. So it is hard. It is very hard. Then you cannot kiss your children or, I mean, I haven't kissed my daughter who lives with me for the youngest one. She's 21, but I, don't, I love to kiss her. You know, I'm not kissing her. And she got like four tested, crazy. Yeah, because if you go, she's afraid and she goes and get tested. Yeah. It is hard. And so the nurses were having a pizza one day. Yeah. And that was the only play, moment that we needed to get 10 people out of the or isolated them because they were having pizza and at the same time, even they were two meters away, they were so, and you know, the directors were very angry and it was a trouble. And I say, I understand them. So now we remove yes. every place where they can eat together. I mean, it's, it's a little, I, I, yes, I think no, that it is, it we is hard. Have, yeah. So I think yeah. that, that you will be faster, okay, with the, with the Pfizer. I don't know. I was planning to travel to the U.S. I mean, on Monday I was going there. I needed to do something. I, of course, I am not going now. Uh, but then I say, if I get there and I can buy the fast Pfizer, I could get the budget <laughs> because <laughs> I know it won't come here because of political issues, completely right. sure. We change the government. With the other government, we will have it. With this one, we won't. But they are saying, well, if the other president was here, everyone will be dead by COVID because he won't decrete the quarantine as we did. And because of that, our numbers are low. And that was a complete, uh, you know, that was not true because as I show you, we have a confined period, the longest in the world. I mean, we were maybe in the guidance records because of the longest quarantine time. And what happened to the whole numbers now and to the death? Nothing. That was something that the government was using to keep us, you know, quiet. But the economy, if it is, was bad, it went down very down because you know everyone nobody was working yeah so i i don't like to cry you know <laughs> every i think every something comes because it comes i mean we need to learn from this mm -hmm. and we learned to work as a team differently to be more you know take care of the others, I had some chiefs that got panic and they never appeared. And now, I mean, they, they are not feeling well because after 10 months, if you're not here, you lose your, people is not nice and you lose your respect and they start to you and I don't care much about that. But sometimes you see that this, the, the work was done with others. And so, is it, there's there will be a lot of human factors that we need to face. Definitely, from now. I love Dr. Violet. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that photograph of your team and um, the entire hospital uh, staff being on the same grounds, and that priority number one was to preserve that team. Um, that understanding, you know, Dr. Langham, when we had um, some of our Ositas talks. Um, we are listening to colleagues, um, many of whom Dr. Baila has trained um, in Europe and Italy and, and Spain, and listening to how um, they lost so many people um, from that staff in the very early stages of the pandemic and realizing what the cost of that was. And so um, really her appro your approach, Dr. Baila, is in terms of trying to figure out a way to first keep that group intact um, and understanding that there are certain individuals that need to be away and, and figuring out ways in which to make them uh, continue to be productive and continue to be relevant and useful and help the overall mission, but then also realizing that others um, 
would be um, more amenable to being in person and on staff and whatnot. Um, I had one question, if it's okay, uh, to ask you, you know, one of the things that um, on the adult side of things that we've realized is um, there are some procedures that traditionally we have been um, keeping those patients overnight, um, uh, you know, and watching them just, just to make sure, right? You yes. know, to make sure they're doing yes. okay. And because of bed availability, um, we have changed. Um, we've, we've really kind of focused on the outpatient follow-up, phone calls, tele, tele, telehealth visits. And one of those areas has actually been bariatrics. And I, I don't do bariatrics, but I've certainly taken care, do continue to take care of a lot of those patients. And I wonder if you have a sense um, of some of those same shifts happening um, in your practice or in your colleagues' practice where normally you might keep them overnight um, and occupy a bed, but because of COVID times and because of bed, bed availability, you've been making that clinical and surgical um, a change of practice um, over the last few months. Yeah, I, I have, as I have told you, I, I believe in teams because I'm not, I'm not a one person work. I, I, I love to have teams and the, the best of the teams is that if you let them go, they develop talents that you can never imagine and they still, you can share with them and, and get, get the advantage. So, suppose if you don't do the teams because you are not Teresa Kakuta, yes, you know, you know, you're not a saint, but do it for, if you, if, for cleverness. I mean, if you are clever, that will be the best way of going. And giving a clinician this very operative session makes us and, and he's part of us now and he's always wearing a green gown which i say the surgeons wear a green gown <laughs> so, and he's with us he has developed this place into the or at the back of the or that you can say this is like the old times when i when i was doing my residency there was a, there was, you know, like a big room where all the beds of the patients were, like the, the European hospitals. This is coming back. Maybe not, because there, he started doing this to convince with us, the directors, that we wanted to do elective surgery and that won't get the hospital beds. And, and so we started uh, even some acute abdomens staying there overnight or going home up before, following them. He has a team, half of his team is doing telephone, te tele, tele following. And all the COVIDs that we do the, the day before are followed by a person with a phone also. So he's very clever, he's creative, and he has the respect of his group. And so that's the way we have been changing this. I cannot tell you, I don't have the data to tell you. We know that we haven't any com morbidity complication because we do every morbidity meeting every, every month of, of general surgery. I am a general surgeon. I mostly, and I still do general surgery in the hospital. I mean, I do surgery and teaching, but it, cardiovascular, Cardiovascular has another one, but we don't leave the cardiovascular there. The cardiovasculars go to a unit, special unit. But there we leave, uh, uh, for example, an ovarian cyst that you do a laparoscopy, we used to say 24 hours. If they come in the early and we try to fix that so they can, they can go home. And a, a gallbladder sometimes. We never, I mean, I know that people do that. We, we have never uh, sent a gallbladder home the same day. So I can't have the list because I'm sure he has it. Uh, and also about any of the divisions I show, I mean, anything that you, you may need, or I know you don't need our, our stuff, <laughs> but I mean that you are interested in because of any project that you have in mind, we can share. But sometimes, I don't know, for example, I don't have a special people taking care of the data, uh, of the data. So I asked the secretary, and my secretary during pandemia arrived after two months because she, and when she arrived, she is fixed to come twice a week to my office because 
the other time she has to go to another office. I mean, administrative people had a different. And after this month, they are, will come back. And some of them will not come back. I don't know why, because this is a public administration. You know what it is. Thank you. They get the salary if they don't come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I have two retired surgeons, one surgeon and one nurse, which for me were the best uh, team in, in simulation. And what I made them, they develop a program that's called wood colostomy. Yes, because we have a lot of, we have a lot of morbidity in colostomies in children, a lot. And so we have this program that the two retired women are doing from their homes because I wanted to keep them active and not lose them for, for when we are coming back. And it's, a, it's, it's so gorgeous, the program. They teach the people to do their own model and we don't even send models. And we teach them to make a colostomy. And we have people from Peru, Chile, and it's free. So they are working hard. Now I want to have an industry to get a salary for them, at least something to, to, you know, to stimulate them, but they are doing it for free. <laughs> well, we will have better times in the lake. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll, all, we'll all come join you, okay, Dr. <laughs> yeah, it will be a nice place to join. <laughs> uh, well, I hope I can visit that, you one that day. That is certain and we hope, we we, we hope you can come visit us. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. We would love that. <laughs> when times are, are, are okay to travel. Thank, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank you for the, you know. Thank, yeah. you, so much for thank you. And Dr. Bailez, we'll share with you um, uh, the video and the link uh, so you can share with your teams back home. Um, and certainly we'll be sharing it with the SAGES group and, and, and you can certainly forward it to IPEG as well. Um, and, and we just so appreciate your time and your energy. Um, I'm sorry you didn't get to meet the other faculty on the, on the call. Our co-director, our, um, co Dr. Feredia was here uh, from Global Surgery. Our department chairman, Dr. Shibata was here and he sends his oh. uh, warm wishes <laughs> and uh, great comments. He, he thoroughly enjoyed your talk. And then we had all level of learners. We had residents here and uh, medical students. So we're so grateful for your time and your energy um, and sharing with your, your data. And I think, you know, um, one of our hopes is that as we've been going through these talks, we have realized there are several projects that can come out of this work as we've shared the data and understand that we're all learning lessons, both clinically and administratively. So we'll hope to be um, active in that area. But in the meantime, um, congratulations on all of the hard work that you all have, um, have done over the past really year now. And um, our hope is that we're all going to be turning a corner soon. And again, we hope to invite you here uh, to Memphis, um, but maybe on the way or, or back on, on the way back uh, from California <laughs> to CJQ. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Dr. Thank Langham, you. for being here as well. And thank for you. All your comments. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.